Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Smith, and I'm here today to talk to you about reactive machine learning. Uh, and today we're going to talk both on the JVM, but then more off the JVM, sort of exploring the wider ecosystem of techniques for building reactive machine learning systems with the perspective of the curious JVM programmer, the person trying to explore uh, the full range of possibilities. Uh, quick intro on me. Um, so what I spend most of my time working on is with uh, data scientists and engineers trying to build large-scale machine learning systems. Uh, right now, I do this primarily in Scala uh, at x.ai. At x.ai, we're an artificial intelligence startup uh, building a personal assistant who operates over emails to schedule meetings for you. Just CC her on your emails the same as you would a human personal assistant, and she'll take care of all of the negotiations around location and schedule and things like that. Uh, it's just x.ai. Uh, of course, uh, after the events of yesterday's election, uh, I'm also uh, planning an exit from the United States. So if anyone knows of a place to find work in the EU, that would be great. All right, let's begin our, uh, our technical discussion. And so uh, one of the first topics I need to introduce this group to is uh, reactive. And so I imagine that some folks here have some familiarity with what uh, their concept of reactive is. The reactive in different contexts means different things. I'm going to define my work a little bit here. Uh, as I would define it, reactive, based on the reactive manifesto, consists of these uh, properties of a system that we want to have, these ideals that we try to design into our applications. Uh, they are these four. First, that it is responsive, that it will return uh, values to the user in a consistent, time-bounded manner. Next, that it's resilient. It will get back up when it gets knocked down. It can handle errors and recover. It is elastic. It can scale up or down in response to user demand and need. And that it's message driven, that we're not coupling all of this together on a single node. Uh, but in fact, we're having some methodology for passing messages across our systems. So this is the sort of uh, traits of reactive systems. But these are just ideals to hold to. Within the original reactive manifesto, they outlined three possible strategies that you could use uh, to implement reactive systems. These are replication, having more than one copy of your data. And this refers to both data at rest as well as data in motion, uh, as we'll see in uh, some common applications. The next is containment. This is keeping your errors bounded within a, a sort of scope, having some ability to know what are the limits of the possible error conditions and what systems they will affect. And lastly, supervision. This is building hierarchies. This is knowing that this component is responsible for the failure of another component and will make decisions based on it. So those are the three reactive strategies. Now, what I would like to discuss here today is reactive machine learning, which is basically applying the techniques of reactive to machine learning. So just as I, I don't want to assume that all of you are, are super familiar with my personal definition of reactive, I'm going to presume that not all of you are familiar with machine learning. Actually, I want to take a quick poll on this one. Uh, who all is working on machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science applications? OK. So I see a decent chunk of folks, and I'm guessing the rest of you are just interested in the topic on some level. Um, so let's begin with what we're, we're going to talk about a couple of different applications of different sorts of machine learning techniques. My personal context is in artificial intelligence. That's what I happen to care about, and that's what I happen to work on. Uh, one of the models that we sometimes use to describe what is artificial intelligence is the agent model. Uh, this is a simplified diagram of, of what an agent might consist of. An agent is, is a thing which can sense and act upon some environment. It has knowledge, uh, and it's able to learn from those experiences, where it senses things, where it receives uh, percepts from its sensors, records those in a knowledge base, and then learns from those actions, and then makes decisions. That function that you see there is what's sometimes called the agent function. That is the portion of the agent that makes decisions. Within machine learning, we're actually only concerned with a small subset of what we have to do within all of artificial intelligence. Specifically, we're concerned with this learning process, whereby we receive in percepts and then have to reason about them and improve our knowledge of the world. As I've broken it down in some of the work that I've done, uh, I think of machine learning as going in this sort of cycle where we collect data, we generate out features, we learn models, we evaluate those models, we publish them out for, 
for use, and then we, we act upon those models. These are just sort of rough guidelines of the sorts of steps we might do here. I'm going to show you a couple of pieces of this life cycle, but we're not going to work through the whole picture of things. All right, so that's my view on what we're going to call machine learning for the purpose of this talk. So let's talk about reactive machine learning. Reactive machine learning is an approach I've been trying to take to understand if reactive is so powerful and so useful for web applications, for mobile applications, uh, how could we apply it to a problem as complex as machine learning? Aren't there going to be more obvious consequences, things that we need to care about within the context of a reactive approach to machine learning? There are two things that jumped out immediately to me when I looked at this uh, problem. First is that the, pro in terms of the properties of the data, first is that the data is effectively infinite in size. We deal with arbitrary scales of data within machine learning context because we produce, produce derived amounts of data. We just create new data arbitrarily. Uh, second, data within a machine learning system is intrinsically and pervasively uncertain. There are all sorts of things we will never know definitively in a machine learning system because the sorts of questions we want to ask are statistical in nature, uh, so that we'll only get an 80% confidence of truth or something like that. From those two properties of the data, certain techniques fall out, certain strategies uh, coming from you know, laziness, uh, higher order functions, immutable facts, possible worlds. These are techniques that are used in other contexts, and these are just several of, of, of the many possible ways that we can use these sort of principles to guide us in a more actionable way in terms of what are, what are the ways we want to attack, how to build machine learning systems in a reactive manner. All right, so that's reactive machine learning. So let's talk about the JVM and why we're talking about the JVM in this context. To me, what I care about in the JVM are, are a few things. Uh, one of them is that it, I can use it in lots of sorts of applications. I can use it in all sorts of different uh, infrastructural environments. There are certain aspects of the runtime that also are quite powerful in terms of what it enables for the performance and the semantics of uh, other languages and uh, technologies built on top of the JVM. In particular, things like garbage collection makes it easier to do things like object-oriented programming, JIT compilation gives us the ability to do highly repetitive calculations like we do in machine learning very simply and very efficiently. And that there's a sort of multi-threading model here. And that's, that's an area that I'm going to dig into a little bit more in this talk as to how this affects how we encode the semantics of, of reactive within our systems. I really like that we can use the JVM kind of everywhere now. Uh, even if the original view of, of what the JVM was all about, the, the whole ecosystem you know, focused on single backend servers, now I spend most of my life reasoning about large-scale clusters. And you can see in, in projects like Spark, uh, but also uh, Hadoop, uh, Mesos, Marathon, all sorts of large-scale cluster technologies, they work very well within the JVM because of some of the properties of the system. But of course, we're also still seeing the expansion of the JVM to, to mobile and embedded contexts as well, which is really exciting for people who want to build artificial intelligence systems. Maybe someday we can give them arms and legs and, and eyes and have them interact in the real world. Uh, unlike, I think, uh, the majority of folks at this conference, uh, I don't actually write any Java. I haven't written any Java in, in many years. Uh, actually, a quick poll. Java developers? All right, yeah, okay. Uh, so this might be a little, be, a little bit odd because I'm not going to show a, a single line of Java in this entire talk. Um, because I, I'm interested in, in, uh, in Java as, as an ecosystem, as a, as a runtime, as a place in which we can build up abstractions which span beyond one single language. Uh, in particular, uh, while, while Java design has done good work with developing out facilities for generics, uh, other languages have been able to build uh, yet more complex type systems on top of that. Um, the JVM in particular has, has recognized the, uh, the sort of innovations that have come in through functional programming, as well as just different traditions of programming, such as dynamically typed program, so that we see things like invoke dynamic, uh, higher order functions being added to Java. But then a wide range of other languages being developed on top of the JVM. Things like Scala, Clojure, Groovy, Kotlin. I'm primarily a Scala developer, uh, and prior to that I was primarily a Clojure developer. And so that's kind of the perspective I have as a, as a functional programmer working within this ecosystem. Some of the cool technologies we've been able to build on top of the JVM that are really important to building reactive systems are some of these higher order concepts, right? That things, some of these come out of a, a more sophisticated view of the world 
uh, than, than we had uh, at, at the sort of dawn of Java, right? These are things like futures, promises, tasks, uh, everything from like Clojure's approach to software transactional memory, uh, Hazelcast data grids, uh, Akka's actor systems, and Spark's RDDs. Uh, these are really powerful tools that I think are, are really core to the argument of why the JVM is so central to the approach that a lot of people are proposing for building reactive systems. A lot of the properties that you want are enabled by reactive programming idioms that are made easier by having support for these sorts of concurrency distribution parallelism techniques. All right, let's get into a more detailed example. I'm going to show uh, just one example actually on the JVM, and then I'm going to launch off into other runtimes and, and talk about how these connect. The first example here is, uh, is Kangaroo Capital. Kangaroo Capital is the largest credit card uh, organization within Australia. They uh, serve uh, the marsupial community there. The problem we're going to work with is their fraud detection model. So fraud detection is a sort of classic data problem that you can use machine learning to accomplish. In this case, we're trying to build up a fraud detection model that helps us decide, given a transaction, does the model believe that this transaction was fraudulent or not. So in the diagram shown above, if we have in fact predicted fraud and we are correct, everything is fine. Our model has done its purpose, it's served its role. If we detect detected fraud and we're incorrect, in fact we've angered our customers there, uh, and then we're going to get a lot of uh, negative feedback from customers, we're going to lose money as we drop customers. Or if we fail to detect fraud, uh, we're going to lose money as well because we're going to allow transactions which are not legitimate to pass through our system and incur further costs. I'm going to show you how to build a basic model that will allow you to, to build a sort of fraud model here, for example. In this case, we're going to use Spark. Uh, folks here using Spark? Anyone? All right, that's decent uptake. So Spark is uh, implemented in Scala, uh, for those folks who don't know. Uh, it has APIs now available for Scala, Java, Python, R, uh, but a very powerful JVM technology that scales up to uh, really some pretty impressive uh, performance feats on cluster scale computing. Here's some basic boilerplate that we must uh, set up to say the context in which we're executing all of these things. This is just basic uh, setup about what is our application on this cluster. We're going to load in our data here. Uh, here's just some example data. And then we need to partition our data into training and test data. Uh, this is a common machine learning technique in which we want to use some data to learn our model and in a later set of data called the test set or the, or the validation set, depending on how you use it, to allow us to make statements about the performance of our model. And then we're going to instantiate a new learning algorithm and we're going to train a model on top of that training set. Now, we want to evaluate this model, right? We want to be able to deploy it in production based on concrete knowledge of its performance characteristics. So to do that, I need to introduce a concept called an ROC curve. This is an example of a good ROC curve. An ROC curve balances true positive rate and the false positive rate. This is a, and so a good ROC curve has this sort of shape we see here where it's, uh, it's above the diagonal. So the area under the ROC curve should be greater than 0.5. If, for example, we had a random model in a binary classification that just said true, false, true, false, true, false, uh, completely randomly, then the area under the curve would be precisely uh, 0.5 on, a, on an aggregate basis. If for some reason we had a perverse model, a model that was uh, actively making the wrong predictions with intelligence, then we would have an area under the curve of less than 0.5. Using this knowledge, we, we can know certain things about our system in particular, are the results of our model training process before ever deploying it to scale on real traffic. In particular, we can know that if a model has an area under the curve of 0.5 or less, there's not the slightest possibility that this model has intelligence encoded into it. It cannot possibly be used on real traffic. It's complete garbage. Here's, an, uh, here's a Scala implementation of how we can do that. Basically, what we're doing is we're taking in a Spark logistic regression model and we're retrieving using the, uh, the facilities provided by MLLib, Spark's machine learning library, a summary of the performance of the, of the classifier, and then we're just going to compare that to ensure that we are above 0.5. So checking back in on, on what this Spark example uh, of fraud detection means in reactive terms, uh, 
one thing to, that may not be obvious for many of that is that Spark is the canonical reactive system. It has all of the properties of reactive systems it, it, in spades. It, it is highly responsive, resilient, elastic. You can, you can run this on arbitrary size clusters, and you can see enormous performance statistics uh, from, from the folks at Databricks and AmpLab about just how powerful Spark is. And it does this using just the techniques we've talked about, that our data is replicated across the cluster, errors are contained so that we can use message passing to communicate, and, that, and then we have a cluster master which supervises all of this stuff. So it is obviously ideal for working with infinite arbitrary scales of data. All right, so that was a quick spark example of how machine learning works in a given tool chain. I wanna jump over into the boundary of, of the JVM. So let's presume that we still want to build the majority of our system within a JVM language of some type, but we have some need to step off for, for some purpose. This is actually a pretty common scenario within the machine learning community. Uh, a large amount of development it happens in languages that aren't on the JVM. In particular, uh, for most data science machine learning research, right now Python is the lingua franca of, uh, of huge amounts of research right now. So we'll look first at how can we just use Python in a better way, in a, in a way that allows us to still maintain some of the nice properties of our, uh, of our uh, JVM-based solutions while still having access to what is uh, perhaps less reliable and less performant code. The context here is Timber. Timber is a dating app for bears. Uh, you s swipe left with your paw or right with your paw, depending on if you like the look of the bear you want. And, uh, and so uh, what Tinder hopefully, Timber is a hopefully able to do is, uh, is uh, made up vegetarian pandas and, and, and carnivorous brown bears and help them find love through the power of modern technology. One of the projects that, work, that they're working on currently is an approach uh, to artistic style. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's seen the uh, work on a neural algorithm of artistic style, uh, more commonly known on Twitter as hashtag StyleNet. Uh, in this case, we're going to try to apply this technique to the problem of producing profile pictures. We want bears to see the best in each other by having their pictures look like they were painted by Monet or something, uh, to give them, show off their true inner beauty. To do this, we're going to use an implementation from TensorFlow. TensorFlow is an open source project released by Google. Uh, the actual implementation of the vast majority of the functionality is in C++, but the only bindings provided to, uh, for that functionality by Google in the original open sourcing are Python bindings. So people have been built various algorithms using neural networks on top of the TensorFlow framework in Python. The one that we're gonna use here is called NeuralArtTF. It's just a random mediocre implementation that I grabbed off of GitHub. And the main thing I wanna point out here is, is a way that we can use this sort of highly unreliable, very foreign code in a way that allows us to simply mate up uh, with, with the system that hopefully we have stronger guarantees around. So at the top we see a standard invocation at the command line of this application. It's, it's sort of Python runtime made available here and it takes various uh, command line runtime parameters. This maps down to a Python function shown below, just the signature, where we pass in certain parameters out to produce the art there, that where we uh, invoke the deep learning model to, to learn the artistic style of the images provided to us. The approach I'm going to take to, to make all of this a lot easier and more reliable is to expose this as a service. Still in Python here, we're going to uh, define out a server which uh, exposes an endpoint that allows us to produce our art and return out successful value as a true Boolean. Uh, so we're just wrapping up the function and instantiating a server instance. Now to be able to talk across uh, the Python runtime here and back to the JVM, we're going to use a library called PyroLite. Uh, this is one of many possible solutions to this problem. In this case, what this allows us to do is use a Java library and a Python library, which, it, which know about each other and, and have common expectations for how to communicate across. In this case, what we're doing is we're instantiating a, a Pyro4 daemon. We're creating a, a name server. And in this case, we're going to 
register this Python application as a service and make it available for our service discovery just by name. In this case, we've defined out our service as neural server. So all this does is it instantiates that object that we saw and, and makes it available uh, to other Pyro services. Let's jump over into Scala land now. In this case, we're going to start to build up our implementation using common Scala idioms. In this case, we want to do an enumeration. Uh, we want to have some sort of static guarantees of well-formed values for our configuration. So these are the names of the types of the uh, pre-learned deep learning models that are used here, the VGG and the I2V. And then we can start to build up our job configuration. These are just our sort of static expectations. This actually mirrors very closely what we saw in the Python. Uh, but now we're able to, um, we want to put this within our Scala code because we want to have our sort of knowledge of what consists of a good and well-formed job invocation exist within our core application. Excuse me. And then this is fairly straightforward to be able to make that connection from our Scala code using the PyroLite library to, to talk to our name server to to simply call out to the neural server. That's our, our location discovery mechanism by name there, just a neural server. And then we're going to find out how to make that call then. Now, since we're back in Scala land, since we're in a multi-threaded runtime with sophisticated higher order uh, functionality defined around how we deal with asynchronicity, asynchronicity uh, we can use things like futures. And so in this case, we're actually defining a timeout here using Scala futures. We've got static guarantees of all of our parameters matching up to the interface that we've defined. And so that we have a lot of confidence that we're going to get back our result. Or if not, we can use various reactive idioms to fail gracefully in the case of, uh, in case of a timeout, for example. What this allows us to do is to take sun bears and make them look like they were painted by Paul Klee or something like that. Checking in on the principles that we have here. So again, this is a sort of approach to getting a more uh, elastic and resilient approach to things. So in the event of, of failure or in the event of, of, uh, of things simply taking too long, we've encoded within our Scala application, using the sort of multi-threaded semantics there, uh, the possibility of failure and what to do in the case of something goes wrong, of course, that is a way of containing things, right? So on this case, the trivial code here didn't actually specify where the Python was deployed, but we can now deploy that Python separately. So for example, uh, TensorFlow often functions better in the presence of a GPU. So you might have a GPU-enabled instance, which performs all of that model learning separate from the compute-optimized instance running the Scala application. Gives us a nice uh, supervisory mechanism there. Um, Right, and so of course this allows us to uh, to take advantage of the the arbitrary scaling properties within uh, being able to make those invocations across a large number of services from our our Scala pipeline. All right, next example we're going to go further off of the JVM, and in this case I'm going to show you examples that are purely from an entirely different language as a way of getting inspiration for what what could possibly be in our future, things that we could learn from in the JVM community. I'm going to show an example within Elixir. Uh, I'm not sure how many folks, has anyone here worked with Elixir, use Elixir at all? Okay, uh, very small number of hands. How about Erlang, uh, the Beam? Okay, more hands for Erlang, okay. So it's been around for a bit longer. Uh, Elixir is, a, is an Erlang VM language, uh, also known as a Beam language. It's a more recently developed language than Erlang, just within the past several years. But it's a similar functional language uh, with a nice homo-iconic syntax, uh, like, like a lisp. One of the key features that I want to explore in using the Beam technologies is the concurrency orientation built deeply within the runtime itself. How does this inform how we build systems and what it makes easy? Checking in on our, uh, what are we going to build here? I want to talk about the the problem of maintaining our knowledge. So within a given agent in an artificial intelligence design, we presume that there is a knowledge base that is an immutable record of facts which we must maintain. Uh, so there's a particular example here that I want to discuss which has to do with the possibility of having a distributed database which has somewhat of a leaky abstraction. In this case, we're trying to record out information about the interactions of users so that we can learn from them. 
but we're re recording that information using the user ID as the primary key. This is all fine, except for that in this particular case of a database not to be named, by using this as our primary key, we've, we've allowed the abstraction to leak. So ID123 is always going to be routed to this particular set of servers within our distributed database. And ID456 is always going to be routed to this particular set of servers. This is all fine unless you see an enormous spike in volume on a given user. For example, if you see a spam or botnet attack of some sort. In that case, we have a serious problem because at that point, our database is going to start failing. It's, it's unable to keep up in this, in this arbitrary example here. So in those cases, we can't perform those updates for those users. And so we have a, a critical challenge ahead of us, which is how do we continue to collect data? How do we continue to accumulate out our fact database without having the problems with ID 456 contaminate all of the other uh, user data acquisition activities going on? And so this is a this is sort of knowledge maintenance problem here. So to begin, we want to perform updates here. This is this is simply just recording out that we've seen something about a user happen of some sort. And so in this case, uh, this is our top level setup. We're going to do things like uh, verify that we have a fuse in place. We're going to write it to the database and parse out our response. The technique that we're going to do here is is a technique. Uh, that's commonly used in reactive programming idioms that originates from uh, from many years ago. It's, it's called a circuit breaker technique. You may have seen physical circuit breakers. In this case, we're using an Erlang library called Fuse to allow us to have a very simple way of defining a circuit breaker. Within our, our, our Fuse verification here, uh, we're simply checking to see if we have a Fuse created yet for this, uh, for this given user. We're creating a Fuse per user. If not, uh, then we'll create one, and if everything's okay, then we'll proceed. Otherwise, if the fuse has been blown, then we need to send back a message and say that we're in a failed state for this user and we can no longer handle updates for uh, user 456. The installation of the fuse here is, is, is purely declarative. We're just saying uh, how many times, in this case we want to say three times within a minute, and then how long do we want to leave the fuse open for. So this is Every time we see that error, we're not necessarily going to blow open the fuse, but in this case we say, if we see an error three times within a short period, we want to we wanna blow open the fuse, we want to leave that fuse open and, and not dedicate all of our resources to handling the updates for this given user because it's not possible. There's, there's some sort of error state corresponding to this user and we're going to simply have to give up this knowledge. In this case, we're, we're mocking out our our badly behaved database using uh, enum.random. And then we're, uh, we're parsing our, our response. In particular, if there is a, so you can see here, uh, this is a form of polymorphism. On the top, if everything's OK, uh, then we just simply send back the OK value. But in the event that there is some sort of error returned out by our database, in this case, we're going to melt the fuse that is signaling to the circuit breaker mechanism that we have failed and we're in an errorable state. Going back up to our top level then, uh, now you can see how these pieces compose. In particular, we're going to check that our fuse exists, then we're going to attempt to write out to the database, and then we're going to see if we got a good result back. If in the event that we did not get the result back that we wanted, we're going to, uh, we're going to message that back to, to a higher level system to allow that to handle it. Not all the aspects of the runtime may be clear here, but this is actually a fairly reactive solution here. In particular, it's very focused on, on the resilience case. How do we encode the possibility of failure within our system? In this case, we've explicitly said that failure can occur at the user level, and we've, we've declaratively set the parameters for response to failure. Uh, of course, we've contained that failure quite tightly and that we've relied upon a supervisory mechanism here. Behind the scenes, this is a full actor system, right? Uh, that's what the Erlang VM was created to, to do. We have the ability to, uh, to, to supervise the possibility of these errors cascading up from our database. Um, right, and this, this is a sort of way of encoding the uncertainty of what we have within our application. In particular, we don't know if we're in an arid state in advance, and so we explicitly build that logic in and, and allow for ourselves to, to detect that dynamically on the fly. 
All right, another artificial intelligence example here. In this case, one of the challenges we often have to deal with in the construction of artificial intelligence is, is actually understanding what we've built at all. Uh, this is not a unique problem to artificial intelligence, but it's very common and it's very challenging. In particular, uh, once we've constructed an artificial intelligence, typically speaking, the behavior, the state space of all possible choices that the intelligence can take is vastly larger than, than our ability to statically reason about it. So we need ways of characterizing what is the behavior of the intelligence after we've already constructed one. So we need, we need good tools to be able to scan over what, what is our implementation, what are its properties, uh, what can I expect of it. The tool I'm going to introduce here is Dialyzer. Dialyzer is another Erlang technology. In this case, it's, uh, it started out life as a, as a pure linter. It was only concerned with things like uh, basic code formatting. Since that time, the Erlang community and the de developers of Dialyzer have, al have developed it so that now Dialyzer is the effective way of applying success typing, the type system of the Erlang uh, VM. And so this is an optional step that you can apply to compiled uh, Erlang or Elixir code. And it will tell you certain properties of your program. In particular, success typing is a form of optimistic outer bounds typing. So it's, uh, it's very uh, different than, than the sort of expectations that we would have uh, from statically typed languages like Java or uh, Scala. So I'll show you a little bit about how this works within the context of the problem of uh, building an ensemble model. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the technique of ensembling models, basically all we're saying with an ensemble of models is that we're using multiple models in combination as a way of making a single decision. So in this case, we're going to take in some raw input, we're going to generate out features, uh, we're going to then make different predictions across all of our different models, and then we're going to combine them together in such a way that we produce a combined decision as a result of the composition of each individual model. First, we're going to generate features. Uh, for anyone who is unfamiliar with this terminology, a feature is a, uh, is a semantically meaningful derived representation of our raw data. And so to generate features is to produce features from raw data. In this case, we're actually using that spec annotation there. That comes from uh, the use of dialyzer. We're going to say what our signature is here. So this is something we don't have to do, generally speaking, within an Elixir program. We don't have to say what our type expectations are. But we're going to do so here because we want to get some help for ourselves. And so we're going to annotate that on here and say that our, our generate features function uh, sh should take a number and should receive a number. Next, we'll define out how we apply all of our models. Each individual model may have different properties. Uh, so, and it's quite common to use many models in combination. So this is what you see here on the screen here could be thought of as a sort of model library. This is the full set of resources we have available to perform predictions. And so uh, I'm not sure if it's entirely clear here, but there's a, there's a bug on this slide. Does anyone see it? If you look at the type signatures, we, we know that we, we want to take a number and we want to return a number. Uh, and these all look fine, except for model B. There's something wrong with model B. All right. Now, to use all these functions in combination, we're going to want to be able to operate on them as a collection of functions. So this is an idiom I call parallel function mapping, not having found a better word. Basically, what we're doing here is we're defining out a, a sort of pipeline of tasks. In the first one, we're going to map over our collection of functions and start out an asynchronous task. That is a, a unit of work to be computed in the background. When it finishes, uh, it will then be returned out and invoked. All right, and so then bringing that together, at this point, we're pretty far into our whole process. We're down at the predictions level. So we've generated out our features. We've defined out what are all of the models that we want to be able to call. And then we've actually invoked each of those models using that parallel mapping functionality. So each of them will happen asynchronously in parallel. And then we just need to ensemble them together. And again, we will define out our uh, ensemble function 
uh, with a type signature here saying that we have a collection of numbers which should return a number. Number In this case, it's just a stub implementation of all these things. These are sort of trivial, fits on the slide sorts of implementations. But with this sort of information, we can now approximate the behavior of a more fully implemented uh, artificial intelligence system. We can reason about what are the behaviors of all the models within the system and what are the possible outcomes of that. In particular, Dialyzer is able to analyze all that and give us results. In particular, it can tell us that uh, we're not going to succeed. After we've compiled our code, we optionally run Dialyzer on top, and what it tells us is that we can't perform a prediction because there's a type error within the invocation of model B. In particular, uh, we cannot call uh, string.upcase. We, we, we have an error within the implementation. We cannot uppercase uh, the number three. That's, that's not a valid type. Uh, and of course, the actual uh, top-level ensemble function will never be called in this case. So this is after compilation. We've determined certain behaviors of our system that are undesirable. The fix here is trivial. We can simply remove model B from our library, or we can fix the implementation. Depends on what is most appropriate for our application. I showed you that example while it, at the absolute function level is, is somewhat trivial to give you a sort of introduction to uh, different approaches to how we can work with type systems. Uh, because I think this is really interesting state space to explore, especially as, as, as JVM developers, and especially the more polyglot you like to approach your development. So I wanted to find out this spectrum between dynamic and static typing. And that's really all I mean by this. So at, at, on the, at the dynamic end of the spectrum, we're talking about there being very few guarantees we get about our code before we directly invoke it. All of the, all of the typing guarantees being done on the fly during execution. And at the very static end of the spectrum, we're saying that there are all sorts of things we can do to our code before ever executing it, using tools like compilers or linters and things like that. So on that spectrum, I would personally place Scala pretty close to the stati static end of the spectrum. Uh, you get a very extreme guarantees about the composition of, our, of your application when using this, the Scala type system. It, it's, it's pretty extreme, and it's uh, much like when working in Haskell, you spend a, an enormous amount of your time making sure that you've satisfied all of the uh, type guarantees before you can do anything useful at all. Uh, there's, there's no possibility of executing your program with a type error in there. So that is good news and bad news, depending on your application. But it's a very extreme guarantee. And I would say, compared to Java, it's a... Uh, it's a more extreme guarantee. Java imposes less as, as a result of its type system. If you just simply look at the sort of assertions that are held uh, within a, the Java type system versus the Scala type system, or if you look at how much time it takes to evaluate them, uh, that the uh, Java C is much, much faster than Scala C, for example, as a result of uh, Scala C having to do much more work, so that we, we effectively are passing off more guarantees to runtime behavior within Java than we would typically be doing within Scala. Where I think this gets interesting is, is not where particularly you fall on the spectrum, but how does tooling enable us to make choices that are appropriate for our application and allow us to adjust based on our, our preferences? In particular, I showed you an example of Elixir Erlang code here, which uh, can have all sorts of errors and still compile and still run. You can still do all sorts of things uh, with... Uh, and, and, and rely upon the type system to be invoked at runtime. But as we saw with uh, Dialyzer, there's the possibility of getting more, right? That you can get greater type guarantees using success typing, which is still a far weaker type system than, than, than Java's, but you can get more when you choose to do so you, through optional invocation of the typing system, which is a really exciting possibility once you get a chance to work with it. Um, if you're not working on an Elixir Erlang environment, this, is, this might be kind of a strange tool, but I would point out that if you're, uh, if you're working in Clojure, Clojure has a sort of similar approach in some respects. Uh, Clojure is another JVM language. Uh, in this case, it's a JVM Lisp, and it has a fairly dynamic approach to types. It's not as loose as Elixir Erlang in, the, in that respect, that there is, a, there is a, a tighter relationship to the Java type system in there. But there's a lot of dynamism involved there. But using tools like core.typed or prismatic schema, we have the ability to, much like we did within the Elixir example, optionally encode what are the type expectations of our application within our closure program. 
which is really powerful to be able to do so, uh, because it gives us the choice around which are the important areas of our application in which we need this sort of guarantee and which ones are not. So kind of recapping that sort of type level overview of, of what we have going on within Elixir and Erlang. Um, first, that uh, we see here that we have an ability to, to reason about resilience here that's, that's really powerful, right? That we, we can decide when exactly do we care about handling errors. Do we want to know before we compile? Do we want to know after we compile? Do we want to know it when we run it? Uh, this gives us strategies for supervision, in particular, if we want to delay all of these things. Uh, we, can, we can use our build tooling as a form of supervision, for example. If Dialyzer is invoked after you've committed your code, uh, but in your continuous integration server, you have the ability to, to then uh, uh, elevate the error handling logic up to that system and so that prevent something like a continuous deploy. Right, and these are... Uh, these are Again, ways of uh, dealing with uncertainty again. Uh, and then we saw several examples of, of how we use higher order functions to encode all of that. So I introduced all of that material to, to end with a sort of perspective on what this means for the future of how we build reactive machine learning systems on the JVM. Because this is a JVM conference, and, and I very much tried to take the perspective of the average attendee here who's very interested in, in how does this affect me and how does this affect the areas in which I work in and the, and the tooling that I use, how does this help? First, I would say that the JVM needs to continue to lead, to be an excellent place for the development of, of some very specific techniques and tools. We saw like the long list of concurrency and distribution techniques that are going on within the JVM ecosystem. Uh, if you look in the, in the book that I've written on, on React machine learning, you'll see things like uh, predictive microservices being defined in Akka HTTP. We have all of these great tools available to us. Uh, if you've never built a large-scale distributed data processing pipeline in Spark, it will blow your mind how much simpler it is than the solutions that have come before. Uh, and the JVM is leading in this area, and I think that's incredible, and, and that's something that we should be very proud about and, and really work to, to push the envelope even further. Another thing that I really care about at the JVM is that it's a polyglot runtime, that we've, uh, we've created this runtime where we can have this, this sort of uh, weird functional programming code growing on top of abstractions that were never meant to support them in, in places like uh, Clojure or in, um, in Scala. And I think that that allows us to, to use the JVM as a, as a test bed for experimentation and growth and allows us to have more incremental approaches to how we add language features to any given language uh, due to the uh, powerful interoperation between uh, various JVM languages. We have the approach of saying, well, we, we think all of this functional programming, higher order function stuff is interesting. You know, maybe, yeah, we, we do want to try that ACA approach to supervision and, and asynchronous handling, uh, but only in 10% of our application. We can do that within the JVM. And this gives us a powerful way of exploring incrementally what are the possibilities and what are the benefits uh, for a machine learning system using these, uh, using these technologies. The other thing that I would say about uh, the future of React machine learning, particularly on the JVM, is that there's still the possibility to learn. And that is that we, we can learn from other ecosystems and other, uh, other innovations with, uh, in other communities. In particular, as I mentioned before, the vast majority of deep learning research right now is going on in native code with Python bindings or py native accelerated Python in some form. And this is huge and important to the development of machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning techniques are tremendously powerful and that we need to ha have a way of interacting with them. And so there, there is a project out there to, to implement a lot of deep learning functionality within the JVM. Um, it's uh, deep learning for J, for anyone who's interested. But we need to accept that we need ways of interoperating with the innovation that occurs on other runtimes um, using techniques like, like services, RPC mechanisms, like I demonstrated. The other thing I think we could learn more is about simple concurrency there. Um, so the Elixir examples that I showed there are backed by a runtime at, at least as sophisticated as the JVM that has all sorts of opinionation about how concurrency should be handled using an actor system within, within the Erlang VM. And that was simple um, because, it, because so much opinionation was in place, we didn't have to specify anything more than precisely the semantics that we cared about. How, how should the circuit breaker open? When should it close, et cetera? If you've seen the equivalent code for Akka right now, 
it's uh, horrendously difficult. And, th and that's a challenge for folks trying to build their applications in a reactive manner who know that they should really care about the behavior of their system at scale and use message passing to safely separate out components. That's just not easy to do today. And that, that doesn't matter if you're a, uh, a Scala developer, Java developer, there's still a lot of complexity and boilerplate in dealing with any form of multi-threading concurrency within the JVM. Uh, and I think that there's better ways that we can choose to build abstractions to make that simpler and easier. And the last point I want to make there is, ar is around modularity. And so I showed you a lot of pick and choose approaches here. And I think that's really the powerful uh, uh, opportunity that stands ahead of the JVM ecosystem. Uh, we saw with an incremental type system, excuse me, the success typing system being applied incrementally in the case of Elixir and Erlang. We got to decide precisely when would we like type guarantees on which compiled artifacts. You can't really do that uh, within the, the JVM as well as I'd like you to be able to do today. Uh, there, there's forms of that, as I mentioned, within Clojure. But I think that we could make a lot of progress by being able to uh, allow people to opt in and get more of those guarantees on an ad hoc functionality. So being able to build up technologies that allow us to say that we this component is dynamic, we want our sort of guarantees here. Um, that's, that's challenging right now within a J JVM application. Uh, it's easiest within Clojure, but it's still uh, pretty hard if you, if you try to use something like Scala, for example. Uh, but I think there's great power in being able to use the sort of opt-in functionality that you can in, say, like a, a polyglot code base to allow you to encode in your semantics in a very uh, detailed and uh, tactical manner that allows you to apply reactive principles and strategies when you so choose. I have a few things to, to ping you about for later if you want to check them out. Uh, first, you know, you're certainly welcome to interact with an artificial intelligence yourself on your own time. Uh, you can hire an artificial intelligence personal assistant who will schedule all your meetings for you. And I would love for folks to check it out. We have a free tier. You're welcome to ping me about your experience in working with Amy Ingram. Uh, the other is that I've written a book on this topic, and you're welcome to check that out as well. You can use the code there, C-T-W-D-E-V-B-E-L, uh, for 40% off of my book or any other book from Manning. Uh, and with that, that's all I have. So thank you very much for listening today. I'd love to take any of your questions. Does anyone have questions? I, I can barely see, so. All right, well thank you all very much. Have a great day.